Hi, I'm Robert Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours, and welcome to the podcast. If you want to make sure you never miss an episode from us, you can subscribe by searching for 80,000 Hours in whatever app you use to get podcasts. That way, you can also speed up the episodes, which is how I much prefer to listen to interviews. Next week, I'm scheduled to speak with Alex Gordon-Brown about working in quantitative trading in order to earn to give, which I expect to be very engaging. Today's conversation really goes into the weeds, and I learned a great deal from it. If you're looking for personal advice on how to pursue a career in technical AI research, stick around, because we get to that in the second half. I apologize for the audio quality on my end. I think we'll have that fixed up by next time. If you'd like to offer any feedback on the podcast, please do email me at rob at 80,000hours.org. We're still figuring out how we can best use podcasts to help our readers, and I'll try to respond to everyone. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dario Amade. Today, I'm speaking with Dario Amade, a research scientist at OpenAI in San Francisco. Prior to working at OpenAI, Dario worked at Google and Baidu and helped to lead the project that developed Deep Speech 2, which was named one of uh, 10 Breakthrough Technologies of 2016 by MIT Technology Review. Dario holds a PhD in physics from Princeton University, where he was awarded the Hertz Foundation Doctoral Thesis Prize. Dario is also the co-lead author of the paper Concrete Problems in AI Safety, which lays out in simple terms the problems we face in making AI systems safe today. Thanks for coming on the show, Dario. Hi. So we plan to talk about the motivations behind technical AI safety research, uh, the Concrete Problems paper, and how someone can pursue a career uh, in this field themselves. But first, we're at the OpenAI offices here in SF. Uh, so tell us a bit about uh, OpenAI and how you ended up actually working here. So uh, OpenAI is a, a nonprofit uh, AI research lab. It was uh, originally founded by uh, Elon Musk, uh, Sam, Sam Altman, and uh, a few other folks. Um, and uh, generally, we're, uh, we're we're working on uh, you know on uh, kind of fo following the gradient to uh, more general artificial intelligence and uh, and making it safe. Um, so I, I joined around um, oh, what was it uh, July of last year, so about uh, about about a year ago, which was a few months after uh, after after it started. And uh, I, I I came here because you know there were a number of. Uh, you know, I th thought there were a number of really talented researchers here, and it was kind of a good environment in which to uh, think about safety in the context of AI research that's already being done. So OpenAI was only founded about 18 months ago, is It that was right? about, about 18 months ago, yeah. yeah. And how many staff does it have now? Uh, so I think there's, uh, last I counted, about 55 uh, people here. Right. So does it have been difficult hiring that many people that quickly? Um, so I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've actually never, never worked at a startup before. Uh, you know, our, our CTO, Greg, Greg Brockman, was uh, pre previously CTO of a, of a startup called Stripe, which now, now has, uh, you know, around 1,000 people or so. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely hard. He's, he's really good at it. It's not, uh, you know, it's not something that I've been super involved in, except on the safety side. Yeah. I guess it's the it's the Bay Area way to have yep. an explosive growth in, in organizations. And and yeah, who's who's backing it? Uh, what's the budget like? Uh, so um, I don't know if I can give uh, exact numbers in the budget. Um, the main donors at this point are uh, Elon Musk, uh, Sam Altman, and uh, Dust, Dustin Moskovitz through OpenPhil. Cool. And, and is what you do pretty similar to what's going on at DeepMind, or are there are there important differences? Uh, you know, I would I would say that the uh, the general kind of uh, the general kind of research agenda at uh, at, at OpenAI in its kind of focus on uh, reinforcement learning um, and in you know learning learning across learning across many environments and trying to push forward the boundaries of what's done instead of just focusing on uh, su supervised machine learning. I would say that's uh, you know that's very similar to DeepMind and uh, probably is one thing that sets. OpenAI and DeepMind apart from uh, from other institutions. Uh, we both have kind of a similar focus on safety. We both have uh, we both have safety teams. Um, you know, I would say o OpenAI is kind of trying to be a, a, a smaller a smaller organization that you know focuses on hiring just you know just the people that we want the most. Right. Um, and and that's that's kind of been. Been uh, been uh, been one of the big differences. There's probably some differences in uh, in in culture as well that are a little bit little bit intangible and uh, and and hard to describe. But uh, I think I think generally our 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 view of uh, you know our view of how how AI works and what what to build in in in, in AI and uh, and the focus on safety are actually pretty similar between the two organizations. Okay, you studied physics, right? You did a PhD in physics. 
Um, and then you switched into AI, or was your physics? So your, my yeah. yeah my my physics work was uh, in particular I specialized in in biophysics. So I was I was thinking about uh, models coming from kind of statistical physics and uh, applying them to uh, kind of kind of models of the brain, and then then also using uh, using uh, techniques from physics and electronics to make measurements to try and validate those models. So uh, you know I, I come from a physics background, but I've been thinking about intelligence for uh, quite a while and how how intelligence worked, and I think. Uh, you know, when I did my PhD, I wanted to understand that by understanding the brain. But, uh, you know, by, by the time I was done with it and by the time I did, did a short postdoc, um, you know, uh, AI was starting to get to the point where it was really working in a way that it you know, hadn't worked when I, when I started my PhD. And so, so I felt like, you know, maybe, maybe it was starting to be the case that the best way to understand intelligence would be to actually directly work on, on, on building parts of it rather than, uh, rather than kind of studying the messiness of the brain. Right. Um, so that was what kind of led to that switch. Do you want to give a quick pitch for why working on artificial intelligence is so important? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, you know you can you can give you know kind of the standard standard arguments that that a lot of people are familiar with, which is that you know if you think about any technology that um, you know that that humans have created, uh, what's allowed us to create that technology, you know, san sanitation, flight, um, medicine, you know, Im improvements in improvements in human health, you know. Improvements in, in ability to, uh, to to feed the world, um, you know, all all of this has been generated by our by our intelligence, um, and our intelligence is relatively fixed. Um, and so, if we were able to build something that was able to match or exceed our intelligence, then uh, you know that 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 would really be increasing the engine that produces a lot of the great things that we do. And you know, and and ultimately, maybe maybe immediately, maybe it would take a long time. Would would give us. A much more complete control over our own uh, biology and neuroscience could could make us whoever and whatever we want to be. Could end conflict, war, disease, that that sort of stuff. That that sounds a little utopian, but I think if we if we push this technology far enough and and, and all, all all goes well, then then that'll be the result. Either either you know either immediately when we build it or over over a somewhat longer over a somewhat longer period of time. But I, I don't see any reason why those things. Uh, why those things uh, 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 can't happen. So I think that's the basic reason to to work on AI. I mean, you know, as as I've kind of written, there 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 are these safety issues where we can imagine situations in which uh, it do doesn't actually uh, it doesn't actually go well. Um, and so, to the extent that that's a risk, um, that's also a risk that we can reduce, and we we can also have leverage by focusing particularly on, on reducing that risk. So, on both the positive side and the negative side, it seems like uh, it's quite a lot of leverage. Yeah, there's 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 just a huge amount of uh, there's a huge amount of leverage to be had, right? So, the previous stuff I was doing was uh, was was in biology, and you know, it's it's great. You can you can help people, you can try and try and cure some some disease, but uh, this feels like it's more even more getting to the, the root of problems. What does the name OpenAI? I mean, does, does that relate to the, to the, to the approach the organization's taping? Yeah. So I, I wasn't actually present at the time that open AI was founded or the, 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 the name was chosen. So I, I kind of wasn't the one who, uh, who, who, who picked the name. I think there's been a fair, fair amount of, 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 uh, of, of misunderstanding. I think there's one group of people who think it's kind of all about, uh, like, like open source and right, releasing right. open tools. And there's, uh, and there's kind of kind of another set of people who I, I don't think many people think this anymore, but who for a while kind of thought that it was about kind of like you know like making a, making an AGI without any safety precautions and just kind of giving a copy to, <laughs> everyone, to everyone and that this okay, would somehow yeah. solve uh, right. solve solve safety problems. Um, so uh, you know um, yeah these were these were kind of two 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 early misconceptions that were around long before I I, I joined I joined OpenAI. My my understanding is that. Um, it's meant to indicate the idea that uh, OpenAI wants the benefits of AI technology to be widely distributed. Um, I see. So Rather assuming, than only going yeah, to the owners. Yeah, or... uh, assuming that uh, kind of safety, safety and control problems are uh, solved and we build AGI, there's then a question about, uh, well, you know, who, who owns it, what happens with it, what world do we live in after it's created? And uh, again, this is, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't the one who, uh, who, who named this or, or set the, set the specific mission statement, but I think Elon's intention with it was, uh, trying to think ahead to, you know, given, given that we built, given that we built an AGI and it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not wildly unsafe, uh, how are its benefits 
distributed throughout throughout humanity. And I think openness is intended to indicate the idea that you know these 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 benefits should accrue to everyone. Right. That's, that's my understanding. OpenAI is a nonprofit. It is so, a nonprofit. Yeah. So if you developed a really profitable AI, how does that work? OpenAI becomes incredibly rich and then like gives out the money to everyone. Or? Yeah. I mean, uh, personally, <laughs> I've personally I've I've no interest in uh, getting getting rich from yeah, uh, right. from, from from AGI. I mean, I think. Uh, it would do so many interesting and, and wonderful things to for, to humanity that uh, you know I, I'm I think the, yeah the the the, the 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 meaning of money would 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 change quite a lot and and even maybe the psychological motivations that would want me to get 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 a larger share are are, are things I could change and and might want to change um, right. so uh, you know uh, in, in you know right like in 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 many ways like you know shares shares in terms of money are maybe not not the right way to think about it but i think uh you know there's there's all kinds of stuff that could happen when 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 agi happens and so some of the things i some of the things i think about are you know where 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 that could where that could go or what that could mean and you know the the summary is we don't we don't we don't know very much because it's it's something we haven't done yet so a lot of it's uh, a lot of it's speculation what do you research here at openai um, so uh, I I mainly work on um, safety. So uh, you know we have uh, we have a safety team that so far uh, myself and uh, Paul Paul Cristiano. So uh, Paul was a co-author of mine on the uh, concrete problems paper, and um, you know has has also written a lot um, online on his blog about uh, about AI alignment. Is pr- probably one of one of the people who's you know I think I think I think you know d- done the most to uh, to you know kind of promote. Clear thinking about the problem and tie it tie it to cur- current AI. We have a third person joining in a few weeks who I'm who, who I'm super excited about. Um, so you know we're we're kind of trying to build up a team that uh, focuses on uh, on technical safety. Um, we also do kind of a little bit little bit of strategy stuff, which is um, you know uh, how how do we get different organizations that are working on AI to cooperate with each other? Um, how do we how do we cooperate with uh, with policymakers on, on on questions like these? So uh, you know we're we're also thinking. We're also thinking a little bit about uh, about about those issues, uh, but but mainly technical safety. I, I also do some stuff that's not not strictly technical safety, but is is generally done to kind of uh, stay stay up to date on where 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 AI is uh, is uh, is uh, is currently going. So I, I did some work on uh, uh, transfer learning a, a while ago that was you know kind of really a little bit little bit safety motivated, but you know trying to make environments that are broad enough that it's possible to see kind of uh, distributional shift or out, out of distribution problems. So that's kind of the range of, of stuff I work on. What's the organizational culture like here? What kind of people does OpenAI attract? Yeah, I mean, I think we've generally been very selective in uh, who who we pick. So I think uh, generally it's uh, it's people who um, you know are uh, are are very kind of very very talented machine learning researchers. Um, but you know, but but also people who you know I, I would say not not everyone, but a large large fraction of people here you know really 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 do think in terms of eventually getting to 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 AGI. Um, and uh, you know, and 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 at least some people, uh, you know, a significant fraction are you know quite quite interested in, or at least at least supportive of uh, you know safety work related to that, or related to what to what we do. Now, there's kind of a wide wide range of beliefs on you know how how, how to work on safety, how possible it is to work on safety from our from our from our current uh, from our current uh, vantage point. So there's kind of a wide uh, distribution of views, but uh, broadly, people are pretty supportive. Right. And OpenAI recently moved away from software development. Is that right? Uh, to more focus on machine learning. So that's not not quite right. It, it's more we. So I think what you're referring to is we had a project called uh, Universe, um, which actually I was somewhat involved in on the machine learning side. And the idea of that project was to uh, make a lot of environments that agents could learn using. Right. Um, and uh, the, the way we did this was using something called the VNC protocol to connect to kind of to connect directly to a browser through pixels. And so that would allow you to play kind of thousands of flash games and navigate web tasks. Um, it, it turned out to be the case. So, so I was actually really excited about this because I saw it as a test bed to study safety, right? If you have 100 flash racing games, you can train an agent on one flash racing game and then see how it behaves badly when you transfer it to another flash racing game. You can kind of study some of these open world uh, problems where an agent has a very wide space to explore and a wide range of actions it could take. And So this is one thing that... Uh 
ML research has been working on is teaching computers to play computer games really well. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is this like is at a superhuman level. Yeah, this is this is so DeepMind has has worked on this with Atari games, and so we were kind of taking it to another level with you know with kind of any any game you can find you can find on the internet. Um, so this this ended up being a project that I think could could probably be described as uh, uh, a little bit ahead of its time. Okay. Um, so um, you know. Uh, it turned out that in order to connect this way, we needed all the different workers who were applying the R algorithm to be asynchronous with one another. And for reasons that were kind of complicated, and we only when we figured out uh, uh, we we only figured out later, um, actually such asynchronous communication was really hard to make it play well with ML, um, and it it it, uh, it led to a lot of complexity. Um, so we're uh, you know we're to some extent de-emphasizing that project now, but um, we've uh, we're kind of you know. We're actually trying to move to doing the same thing with more more synchronous environments. Um, so so basically, kind of the the same idea, but uh, you know, but more um, you know more more in a way that's uh, more amenable to to ML benchmarking and to to measuring how how well we're doing and doesn't have this kind of hard to interact with property. So it's it's more kind of like we we made a tool and uh, you know. It was a good first attempt at, at something ambitious, but it, it wasn't it wasn't quite the right tool. So so now we're working on you know kind of changing it to a version to a version that's better. Um, you know I wouldn't say we've gone gone away from uh, software engineering so much as uh, we've been experimenting with how with how to produce tools and uh, it takes a few iterations to get that right. Okay, so turning now to the broader issue of superhuman AI development, uh, what do you see as the potential uh, dangers here? Why, why should anyone be worried about this? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, you know, my my attitude to, to start off with has has always been, you know, although although I do think about uh, I do think about AGI, which is a term I, I prefer to use than superintelligence, because I think I think no one knows whether uh, you know a machine will, will rocket past human level or not. Um, so uh, so that's something that, that could happen or not. But but AGI is something that I think definitely will will eventually happen. So I kind of prefer prefer to talk in terms of that. And then even 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 within safety, you know, in, in concrete problems, I've kind of explicitly tried to think in terms of not how powerful the systems are, but conceptually what can go wrong with them. So the same kind of thing could go wrong with an AGI as could go wrong with, um, you know, a, a very simple agent uh, playing a video game or a robot cleaning your house, right? If it, if it has the wrong if it has the wrong objective function, if you don't specify its goal correctly, it can do something unpredictable and therefore dangerous. Um, and so, you know, in general, when I talk about safety, I talk about safety kind of generically, whether it's in powerful systems or very, very, very weak systems, that all that said, with respect to powerful systems in particular, I mean, I think there, there is a possibility that if we either do a bad job specifying the goals of complex systems or just they're unreliable in the way that self-driving cars are unreliable, um, you know, a, a self-driving car has to have a very high standard of safety in, in order to, you know, trust it to drive on the road, right? For for almost a decade now, we've had self-driving cars that are 99.9% .9 safe, but that's not enough. We need them 99.999% safe. Um, and so with AGI, which is something that, you know, it, it's going to take a lot more novel strategies than self-driving cars. The space in which it operates is a lot broader than self-driving cars. If you just transpose that kind of safety testing from you know self self driving cars to, to 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 general intelligence, then kind of even with all the controls you put on and even with all the safety standards, it's clear that kind of at, at the very least we're going to have a, a big challenge in making sure that something doesn't go wrong. And you know if something something does go wrong, it, you know it, it would be easy for you know uh, uh, or it might be easy for a large amount of harm to be done relatively quickly, right? So you know you have a, your your AGI controlling the stock market or the economy or something, and it just doesn't know how to do it very well yet, and something goes wrong, and it takes it takes a long time to to unwind that. So there's kind of a long tail of you know things of varying degrees of, of badness that could happen. You know, I think I think, you know, at the at the at the extreme end is the kind of Nick Nick Bostrom style fear that that an AGI could destroy humanity. And, and I can't see any reason in principle why that couldn't happen. Um, if it was sufficiently if, if powerful it, yeah, if, or if, sufficiently if, if, good if at was, accomplishing its goals. It was sufficiently powerful and uh, you know like safety had been handled sufficiently badly, um, that is that's definitely something that that can happen. 
Um, you know, so, you know, it's, I think there are folks at places like Miri who say that this is the default outcome or this is, uh, you know, like, like, you know, really, really likely to happen or there's almost no way to avoid it or you have to solve some incredibly hard math problem to avoid it. I, I don't generally agree with, uh, with, with any of those things, but I think, I think this is a, a possible outcome and uh, at the very least as, as a tail risk, we should, uh, we should, we should take it seriously. Um, I think uh, you know an, another thing. Another thing I'm worried about is that uh, you know the 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 wrong. Even if we manage to make a superhuman a- AI safe or, 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 or an AGI safe, then uh, you know the it might it might be used for the wrong ends. I um, by, deliberately, by, yeah, yeah, deliberately used for the wrong ends by you know by by a disturbed individual or, or an organization whose views are not aligned with humanity or nation state whose views are not 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 aligned with humanity. So that that's in my mind the range of risks. Right. Um, so, do you think there's much of a chance that the that the risks are being overblown here, and uh, in fact, we're just going to end up delaying something that could be incredibly useful and make life a lot better? So, I mean, you know, I you know, it it may it may very well turn out. Maybe it's more than fifty percent chance that uh, as we get closer and closer to AGI, then uh, you know, kind of it it becomes kind of clearer how to make something safe. Maybe it's just like you know, the goals are specified in a way that's that's kind of very very cordoned off from uh, from the tasks that are done you know that 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 we that there are certain you know problems of nature like you know scanning brains or something that we need AIs to do yeah. for us in, in order to get you know in order to to, to gain control over our, our our biology or control over resources and and then there are human values and maybe there can be an efficient division of labor where there isn't much can, can, there isn't much confusion, or maybe safety problems are just a bunch of research and machine. They're just a corner of machine learning research where we haven't we haven't done much yet, and so we haven't tried. And so, you know, I can I can think of lots of ways, and maybe it's even the most probable way where things turn out totally fine. Um, yeah. But you know, I wouldn't. You, you I wouldn't don't want to count on it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't in any of those worlds say the risk was 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 overblown, right? So you know, it's like. Um, you know, uh, suppose suppose you have a fire alarm and someone's cooking a barbecue, and you know it's it's smoke, and uh, you know you wouldn't you wouldn't call like installing the firearm overblown, right? It's right. just sometimes you'll have a fire and sometimes you won't. Um, but uh, you know, like installing the installing the firearm is the right the right the right course of action. So yeah, I, I think of this I think of this as a as a precaution, and uh, you know I don't really think of it. I don't think of anything I do as slowing down the rate of of, of AI progress, or at least I'm not trying to do that. Right. Um, you know, I I think of it as uh, broadening the scope of AI progress and thinking about AI in a more kind of interaction and, and human centered way. If you know, if if anything, maybe it accelerates progress a little bit. Although that's probably 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 a minor effect. But uh, you know, if if uh, if if people are worried about progress being slowed down, I I don't believe anything I do is doing that. It's causing that, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, how much of OpenAI's work is focused on on these kinds of problems? It sounded like five percent of the staff, but yeah, I guess so, other people are worried about it too. Yeah, or? I mean, I think you know, I think I think broadly, um, mo- most people at OpenAI are worried about you know, or, or you know, at least think these issues are worth thinking about. Um, but you know, that's different from you know who is who is actively you know doing their technical work on it. So you know, I would say it's uh, you know three three or four people. Uh, now and you know I'm hoping that 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 grows somewhat um, and you know we're we're actively looking for for really talented people, um, but you know I think OpenAI as an institution has the the, the general idea that you know you, you have to, in order to in order to work on AI safety you have to be at the forefront of of AI and that uh, you know if also if you're at the forefront of AI you have a better ability to implement AI safety in the final system that's built. Um, so, you know, many people are kind of interested in safety in the long run, but I think, uh, until recently and, and even so now, uh, I think many people here don't, don't, you know, don't know if there's a, a way to work on safety right now. They're, they're kind of skeptical that you're able to work on safety right now with, with kind of concrete work. And so I've been kind of trying to change that with, with concrete problems and with this recent paper that, uh, that, 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 that Paul and I wrote on, uh, kind of learning complex Human, human preferences, you know, we're trying to show that there's concrete work that can be done. And that's kind of had a variety of reactions. Some people are like, yes, this is exactly what you meant with safety work. Now I see how it can be done. Some people are like, well, that's good machine learning work. I, I don't actually see how it connects to, uh, to AGI. And so then, you know, we'll try and write another paper and say, okay, this is how, you know, this, this is the line we're drawing and this is how we think it, 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 it gets us there. And, you know, it actually could turn out that this is mostly just, uh, mostly just ML work and uh, the final systems we build are different enough that, 
uh, for whatever reason, this ends up not being relevant to safety. But again, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy in that world. If there was nothing concrete, it was possible to work on in safety. And I instead ended up, you know, doing a, doing a different direction in machine learning, then, 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 you know, that, that, that ends up being fine. It will turn out, then it will turn out we couldn't have worked on safety until later. And, and then we'll work on safety later. Um, whereas in the world where it does matter, it's, you know, it's really great and really impactful to get a head start on it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious to, to get your view on this debate that I've seen online. Uh, yeah. So, so you have this uh, contrast. Some people like uh, perhaps uh, Bostrom could be accused of this in, in the book Superintelligence yeah. of uh, talking as though once we have a superhuman AI, then it will get like very much smarter very quickly. And it could potentially just like solve all of these problems. It could solve yeah. war, you know, solve aging, like yeah. solve all of our health issues. Um, as, but I've seen some people criticizing this online, saying uh, you just think this because you're a bunch of nerds and you think that uh, that thinking is the way to is the way is the way to change the world, the way that everything gets done. But it's, but it's not going to be so simple. Even if you had a very intelligent machine, it wouldn't necessarily be able to solve those problems. Do you have, do you have a view on that debate? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I'd actually. So I think yeah, not quite. I, I'd, I'd rephrase the debate a little bit. Um, to I think there's an interesting technical question of like. Let's say I built an artificial general intelligence tomorrow, and because it's software, let's say I made a hundred thousand of them. You know, how much does that fundamentally change our our society and our technological capability? Mm. Um, so, you know, a, a, a lot of it is just you know you can look at individuals throughout throughout history that you know that managed to discover a lot more than 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 other 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 individuals, right? Mm. You know, you look at you know you look at you know von uh, Neumann, yeah, or, von, von you know von von, von Neumann or. Uh, you know, or, or, or Einstein or, or, or one of these figures who just, you know, managed to be leaps and bounds ahead of others. And the question is, like, what's what's the ceiling on that? Um, you yeah. know, if we if we um, if we, um, you know, invented AGI tomorrow, would it take like a couple days to scan all of our brains into into, you know, into software, up, upgrade us, give us indefinite life extension? <laughs> or, you know, would it just be kind of like, oh, it's it's you know, it's 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 more humans to talk to. Mm. Um, and, and I think I think it's actually complicated. I think uh, some people act like it's obvious. One, one way or another, but it's it's not really something I, I it's not really something I have a lot of certainty on. In part because I think uh, you know modern science has experienced a lot of kind of diminishing labor, you know, like like um, uh, uh, diminishing returns, d- yeah, diminishing return, like the depletion of, of low hanging fruit, and so um, you know it, it could turn out that like solving biology is just this kind of exponentially complicated combinatorial problem, or mm. it's limited by data and experiments. Of course, maybe the machines will like allow us to do do the experiments much much yeah. faster. Then there's some limit on the physical reaction time of the of the biological systems. Um, yeah. When you when you put it all together, do we get Zoom? You know, to to do something much 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 faster than than we ever could, or we, do we get just some kind of mild acceleration of what of what humans can be doing? I, I feel like many people act as if as if the the answer is obvious, but as someone with a with a background in biology and even even thinking about all all the directions in which machines can optimize it, my my guess is machines could probably make things happen pretty fast. But uh, yeah. I think there's huge uncertainty here, and uh, I don't really think anyone knows what they're talking about on this question. Yeah, because my background is in, in is in economics, and I and I imagine. Yeah. If you had an incredibly smart AI and it was trying to figure out macroeconomics, like understand understand yeah. recessions and, and and booms and bust cycle, uh, I suppose it could have like lots of conceptual breakthroughs, but you can only take the measurements so quickly, and you can't yeah. really run experiments. So it could end up being that you know the, the processing of the data that we get is extremely good and very fast, but then then the data only co- comes in so quickly, so, and there's only so, so much so you can fast. actually learn. There's there's some subtle stuff which is like I wouldn't be surprised if, for example a really powerful AI wouldn't be able to understand our macroeconomic systems because of this data issue, but it, it would be able to design a better ac- macroeconomic right, system right. from first. Pr- so it's, it's weird. There's, there's some stuff I feel like, you know, you just, you just redesign it and you can do it much better. And there's uh there's, there's other stuff that, um you know, that, that it, it's just, it's just really difficult. So I, I find this puzzling and I, I don't, I don't really You're have. fairly agnostic. Yeah. I, I'm pretty agnostic on it and I, I don't really, I don't really have a good answer on the kind of like nerds think think AI can solve solve everything <laughs> uh, 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 question. I mean, I think uh, there are some deep set problems in uh, in, in human nature, um, but um, you know, and, and and so you know, just just uh, solving resource constraints isn't isn't going to solve war. We've you know mm. probably in some ways already solved 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 resource constraints. Um, 
but uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe maybe having having true AGI will allow us to redefine what it what it means to be human, and and we'll, we'll ultimately uh, elevate we'll, ourselves we'll, above yeah, conflict. Yeah, we'll ultimately uh, we'll, uh, we'll 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 elevate ourselves above our petty human bickering, or maybe the petty human bickering well, perhaps will, the will, will prevent us from being able to <laughs> right. to elevate elevate ourselves. So so we'll, we'll be stuck. So I, we'll, I don't know we'll, I don't we'll know about that either. Superhuman yeah. levels of petty yeah. bickering, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I I don't I don't actually know. It's 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 actually very hard to know. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked. A, a few, uh, well, we've mentioned a few times this paper, "Concrete Problems in AI Safety." So, yeah. so let's dive into that. Uh, but before we uh, discuss those problems, what was your impetus for writing it? So, I mean, you know, I kind of had been aware of the work of the AI safety community for 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 a while, but had you know had, had in general felt that um, I, I wasn't particularly happy with the way they were phrasing things. Uh, it, it didn't seem like what they were describing was was actionable, and there wasn't a lot of tie to like. You know, AGI was generally discussed in these very abstract terms as, you know, ha like have, having a utility function and kind of having incentives to do this or that. And, uh, you know, discussing things at these very abstract level, I couldn't help but feel that there were a lot of implicit assumptions that were not really being discussed. Um, at the same time, you know, the, the mainstream uh, machine learning community, which I'd, you know, been, been a part of for, for about a year and a half, having a lot of experience with uh, speech recognition systems, one thing that I, you know, I found about neural nets is that they're very powerful, but they're very unevenly powerful. So, you know, the the key example I gave early on was, you know, you can you can train a speech recognition system on, you know, ten thousand hours of American accented data, and then then it's with, for someone with an American accent, it gets it perfectly. Then you give it someone with a British accent or an Indian accent or something, and it just does terribly on it. And you know, of course, if you train it on enough diversity of accents, then it starts generalizing better. But, uh, you know, what, generally when we build engineering systems, uh, that kind of, you know, s silent, random failure, um, you know, it's, it's not something that, uh, that we see as a desirable property in, in systems we build, particularly safety critical systems. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, fixing those kind of problems was, was not just kind of, uh, a, a, a one by one thing where we're like, oh, we're using a neural net again in a self driving car. Let's statistical test for everything we can get. Or you know, we're 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 using a neural net now in a in a drone. Let's let's make sure it doesn't shoot someone. That you know, um, that that we could have principles behind what 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 gives us guarantees on the behavior of a system, or or at least what what gives us statistical guarantees. Um, that seems super interesting to me, and it really didn't seem like uh, seemed like very. Uh, it seemed like uh, very very few people were uh, were actually working on it. Yeah. Um, so uh, I um, yeah. So I you know uh, me and some of my uh, uh, colleagues, Chris Chris Ola at, at Google, Paul Cristiano, who's now at uh, OpenAI, Jacob Jacob Steinhardt at uh, Stanford, uh, uh, John John Schulman here, and uh, and Dan Minet, who is another uh, another, another Googler, uh, kind of you know. Uh, you know, had had all thought a little little bit about this problem, and so uh, you know, we decided to kind of get together and write down all, all all of our ideas in in a paper that would you know kind of lay out an agenda for what why we think this is a thing. Um, and, and in particular, I think um, you know, I felt that the machine learning community as a whole was like a little bit confused. I think that the they largely thought AI safety was about you know fears that uh, that AIs would kind of like malevolently rise up and attack their their creators. Um, and, uh, and and even when they didn't think it was about that, they worry that the people who talk about AI safety will feed into fears that that it's about that. And and so I you know I felt I felt like this was kind of a silly state of affairs, and that you know like of course we can do research on making systems safer and more reliable that that doesn't kind of trade on these fears. Yeah. Um, and and in particular, we can even do research that ultimately points towards AGI. I think the important thing is that. You know, we shouldn't go around with every other word we say being being AGI, and in particular, like the research itself shouldn't be specific to AGI. You can't really research AGI now because we can't build an AGI. So, you know, a, a, a very a, I think a very standard technique when when doing you know research on a topic is you know if you want to think about a topic that's kind of abstract or in the future, then come up with a short term bridge to it that that lets you think about something conceptually similar in a way you can empirically test now. Um, and so that that was the general philosophy behind the paper and the philosophy behind the follow ups that we we and others have have done to, you know, to implement the research agenda described in the paper. Yeah. That's, so, what are some of the concrete problems? Do you want to tackle yeah, one sure. or two here? Um, so I can I can I can I can uh, I can go into them briefly. Um, you know, I think um, 
we, we kind of made a distinction between uh, problems that relate to what happens if you, uh, if you don't have the right objective function and what happens if you do have the right objective function but something goes wrong in, in, in the process of learning or training the system. Yeah. So, uh, you know, not, not having the wrong objective function, the extreme version of that is kind of what, you know, what's, what's, what's talked about in, you know, kind of the, the classical AGI sa safety stuff, which is, you know, you wanted to specify a goal and uh, you, you know, you, you kind of, for, for whatever reason, you know, you had some simple instantiation of the goal and it kind of ends up not, not quite being the, the right thing. So, yeah. uh, you know, we call that kind of the, the genie problem. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. We, we call that reward hacking. And so, you know, few, few months ago using a, 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 a an environment in the now de-emphasized universe, uh, um, uh, uh, program, uh, I had a kind of an example of like a boat race yeah. where, uh, you know, the boat's supposed to, uh, the boat's supposed to, uh, you know, go around and do a few laps. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, what it's trying to do is finish the race as, as fast as possible. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the only way it's able to get points and you kind of can't change this because it's the way that the game is programmed is, uh, you know, you kind of, you get points as you pass targets along the right. way. But it turns out there's this little lagoon with all these targets, <laughs> and the targets also give you turbo, so they make you go faster and uh. faster. So you can just loop around in this little little tiny lagoon and not finish the race. And so, right. so it's like, uh, you know, in one sense, you shouldn't be surprised. It's the correct solution. It's how you get yeah. the most points. But the idea is that, uh, you know, the, the mapping from well, this is the reward function to this is the behavior that it leads to. It's a very twisted mapping. Yeah. And so the point is that it's, and it's not what we yeah. would have intended it for it's, it to it's be. It's not what, what you would have intended it to be. So the, 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 the lesson of that is that it, it's, it's very easy to make small changes in the, in the reward space um, and, and have that lead to big differences in, in the behavior space and also for that mapping to be very opaque. For you to look at a reward space, think you know what it means, and, and in actuality, it, uh, it leads to something very, very different. Yeah. Um, than than what you kind of uh, you kind of you kind of would have would have expected. So you know we we called that generalized reward hacking, and then mm. kind of there was another problem called uh, called called negative side effects, which is a little related to that. Which is just that if your if your if your reward function relates to a few things in your environment, and your environment is very big, yeah. um, then there's kind of kind of a lot of ways for you to do destructive things. Mm. So it's one particular way in which it's easy to specify the wrong the wrong reward function. Mm. Um, because you haven't put in side constraints. Yeah, that... you haven't you haven't explicitly put in the the ten thousand you know the other ten thousand side ten thousand other things other things you care about. Um, then there was this thing called uh, called called uh, scalable supervision, which is uh, you know if you're 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 a human trying to specify a goal to a to a machine learning system, even if you have a clear idea of what it is that that needs to be done, mm -hmm. um, then uh, you know you don't you don't have enough time to uh, to to control every you know to control or give feedback on every action that an AI system does and mm -hmm. and you know and therefore you know uh, limits to your ability to control and supervise can lead to a system behaving in a way you, you hadn't you hadn't intended because it's interpolating in the wrong way yeah. um, so those are kind of the problems with uh, you know like the um, you know the the classical AI safety type problems of like you had the wrong uh, mm -hmm. you know you, you somehow you gave yourself the wrong goal in a way that was hard to understand yeah. um, and then um, the, you know, the, the kind of more technical-ish problems that relate to, you know, your system was trying to do the right thing, but something went wrong. Mm. Uh, it's things more like um, this thing we call distributional shift, which is yeah. when your training set is different from your, your testing set. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the classical example of this is like, uh, you know, when, 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 when I was at Google, there was, there was an incident where, uh, you know, Google's photo captioning system um, had been... Uh, you know, they, they had this photo capturing system that was trained on a lot of photos. And it turned out that uh, most of the photos were, uh, you know, statistically biased to be photos of Caucasian people. Mm. And, uh, you know, and uh, there were also a lot of, uh, a lot of like animals and monkeys in it. Um, so mm. unfortunately, the system, uh, you know, the system reacted, you know, when, when, uh, uh, when a black person took, took a picture of themselves in the photo, it tagged them as a gorilla because it had only seen uh. humans with white uh, skin. So this was, of course, incredibly offensive. And uh, yeah. Google had to apologize for it. And, uh, you know, they, they even had, you know, they'd even kind of thought of this a little bit ahead of time. But the neural net ended up being so screwed up that it didn't even warn them that, um, you know that it was kind of in a region of the state space where it was kind of kind of dangerous. Yeah. Um, so you know, because the, the algorithm has no concept of, the, the, of what's offensive. Yeah, the, the algorithm. It, it, yeah, it's, but, it's it's just. It's, it can it's, it's, yeah, produce it's, a pretty it's, horrifying it's, outcome. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just a statistical learning system. It, you know, it doesn't doesn't know about it doesn't know about 
racism. It doesn't know about racial slurs. It doesn't know about what's offensive. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's just, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a learning algorithm, and uh, it just learns from the data it was given. And and you know, the the there turned out to be some problems with the data that it was given, and there turned out to be some problems with the algorithm. And and so you know, it, it just, it just, you know, kind of in, innocently produced this extremely offensive uh, result. Right. Um, and and you know this is the, the world of neural nets is, uh, is 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 full of this. You know I think uh, so, something related to this distributional shift is uh, a- adversarial examples, which you know my colleague Ian Goodfellow works on a lot, which is kind of when you intentionally and adversarially try to disrupt an input to a machine learning system and make a very small change to it that kind of causes something bad to happen. They're a little complementary. Adversarial examples is like a small but carefully chosen, uh, like you know. Uh, perturbation to it, whereas out of distribution is this kind of like holistic perturbation to it. So resistance against those two is is kind of uh, uh, it's 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 separate, right? You're talking about two orthogonal directions in the in the perturbation space. Um, but uh, you know these are these are all issues with uh, you know making sure that when you when you train something that um, it uh, you know it, it behaves in a new environment the way you would intend it to behave, or or if it goes wrong that it fails gracefully. Right. Um, and we haven't put a lot of. I mean, we you know we put some work into this area. We cite a lot of papers in the in in, in the concrete problems paper. But I think uh, you know r- you know kind of re- relative to the stampede of work in, uh, in 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 mainline AI, I'd like to see more of this stuff. Mm. So uh, I think you did an interview with the Future of Life Institute, where I think you talk about this paper for about yeah. for about half an hour. So yeah. people who are interested can can, yeah. can go and listen to that, and, and you get more detail on each of those different five problems. Um, but yeah, h- how do these problems tie together the, the long term concerns with the with the short term ones that we have today? Yeah. So so I think I think the attempt was kind of to come up with some conceptual problems that relate to both that have long-term and short-term versions, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, with something like a distributional shift, the short-term version of it is something like the gorilla. Yeah. Um, the long-term version would be something like, well, I've, you know, I've trained an AGI in a simulation and then I put it in the real world and a lot of things are different. So does it, does it break a lot of stuff without meaning to? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the super intelligent version of it is, you know, it's like whatever. It's, it's like, but more extreme. It's more the same, but more extreme. It's building a Dyson sphere. It's never built a Dyson sphere before. Like, does something <laughs> go wrong? Um, you know, just whatever, whatever outlandish thing you can think of. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I, I, think, I think the point and the explicit strategy was that, uh, you know, people often kind of contrast long-term versus short-term approaches as if, working on short-term safety and long-term safety are like different topics and like they trade off against each other. Mm. What, what I'd rather do is have a thread running mm. from long-term to short-term things mm. where you kind of, you kind of identify what the fundamental problems are, right? And then, then you work on them on, on short-term problems. And then as the systems get more powerful, you update your techniques and okay. it, it creates this kind of more symbiotic where you're following yeah. along. You know, I think safety shouldn't be anything different from reinforcement learning, right? Reinforcement learning is a general paradigm for learning systems. You can use it to do something as simple as walk across a, gl- a grid all the way up to playing Go, all the way up to, you know, perhaps build, you know, building a building a system that's as, as intelligent as humans. It probably wouldn't literally use reinforcement learning, but the, you know, the it's the reinforcement learning is a general paradigm that runs from things that are very simple to things that are very complicated. So I, I guess the idea was to to do the same thing for safety. Um, come up come up with some some general principles that will 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 car- will you know will will carry across towards very powerful systems. Not and I wouldn't say these problems uh, you know tell you everything that could go wrong with powerful systems. I think there are almost certainly things that are very specific to powerful systems, but. Uh, you know, my, my, my general view is uh, I'm much less confident in our ability to identify those problems. Uh, may, maybe we can, some people are trying, but, uh, yeah. you know, let's, uh, my, my view is just, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot, there was, uh, it seemed like there was a lot sitting on the table. Let's identify the problems we can identify. Let's work on them. And then, uh, then, then whatever, whatever's left, we either have to work on them very late in the process or, uh, you know, or maybe so, someone can identify them, but, uh, but that seems like the higher hanging fruit. Yeah. So, 
so the hope is that in order to solve the long-term problems, you want to find cases that are similar today where you can get feedback on whether it's actually helping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I think that uh, I think that there's kind of a magic of uh, empiricism because uh, it's it's very easy to kind of engage in long chains of reasoning about uh, a, a topic uh, that that kind of don't get tied back to, uh, to 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 reality. Of course, the risk of working on short-term stuff is that it uh, it doesn't matter or it doesn't generalize, and so you know the compromise I've come up with is try and think of things that are conceptually general and then try them, try to tie them into, into empirics. Um, yeah, so to that end, has, has OpenAI made any noticeable progress on, on these problems or, or other problems? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think about, about three weeks ago, uh, Paul Cristiano and I and uh, Tom Brown here and um, three people at, uh, at, 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 at DeepMind, uh, including uh, Jan, Jan Lique, uh, Martin Miljic, and uh, Shane Legg, um, came out with a paper called um, uh, Deep Deep Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences. Um, so this kind of works on the reward hacking, scalable supervision side of things. So the, the way this paper works is, you know, normally you have a reinforcement learning algorithm. It has a goal or a reward function, and you, um, you know, the, the agent acts to maximize that reward function. So this works pretty pretty well for, you know, for something like, um, you know, like chess or go, where uh, the behaviors are incredibly complicated, but evaluating the goal is pretty easy, right? You know, with Go, it's like, you know, are you in a winning position? Do you have more territory? And with chess, it's have you checkmated the king or have you been checkmated? Um, and so it's really easy to, to evaluate these simple goals with a script. And so you can, you can run the algorithm through, you know, millions or even hundreds of millions of games. And, uh, you know, the goal evaluation is, is easy. But, you know, most of the stuff that we do in, in, in real life, the goal is complicated. It's like, you know, car carry on a conversation or, you know, be an be a effective personal assistant to, uh, you know, to, to a human, which, which means scheduling things for them, making their life easier, but, you know, not emailing all their private information <laughs> to, their, to their boss or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of, like, context-sensitive stuff. Um, which is, you know, which is kind of part of what makes, um, you know, is part of what leads to safety problems. If I take a complicated set of goals like that mm. and I try and force it into the framework of a hard-coded reward function, um, it's going to lead to something that makes everyone unhappy. Yeah. Um, because you know, it, it just the two things don't don't fit together. I, you is know, it that it's maximizing on one dimension and then fails on all of the others? Yeah, yeah, or 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 just that the intrinsic number of bits of complexity in something like hold a good dialogue is is very high. And so if I try and program that in, I'm either going to be programming for a very long time, in which case I'll probably make an error, um, or if I try and make what I program simple, then, uh, you know, then it's, you know, it's, it's, there's just not going to be enough bits of information in it to fit the actual complex nature of the goal. So I, I'm either going to be very error prone or I'm just not going to be capable of learning what I, what I need to learn. Um, and so that, that's, you know, that's, that's why people talk about, you know, like strategies for absorbing values and, and things like this. So um, what, what our paper basically does uh, to, to address this is it replaces the fixed reward function with a neural net based model of the human's reward. So the idea is you have a reinforcement learning agent that's learning, um, and, and at the beginning, you know, it starts acting randomly, and every once in a while, it gives um, it um, gives some examples of its behavior to a human. So it'll come out with two video clips, and uh, you know, the human looks at the video clips and says, uh, "Is the left better or is the right better?" Um, the human says left is better or right is better. So, you know, if it's, uh, if it's playing, playing pong or something, then, you know, if the left is, you know, point got scored on you and the right is you scored a point, then the human will say the right is better. Um, and then, you know, the, the agent builds a model of what reward function would lie behind the human's expressed preferences. Um, so the reward function becomes something kind of implicit and learned observed from, from the human's behavior. And then the RL agent gets to work saying, yep, this is what I think the human's goal is. I'm going to go and try and maximize this. But then it comes back to you and it gives you more examples of behavior. And then, and then you know, the human decides on those. And so over, over time, it, you know, the human is given kind of more and more subtly different examples of behavior. And uh, the reward predictor in response learns to discriminate them and gets a more refined understanding of what the human prefers. And then the RL algorithm then tries to maximize that. 
and then the consequences of its behavior are then given back to the human. So it's this kind of mm. so like, it's kind of three steps, like the human, and yeah. then the AI that's trying to figure out what the human's optimizing for, and then the thing that that does that. Then, then, but then, like most of the time, it's asking the intermediate AI. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Most so of the time it's feeding it back into this have, intermediate yeah, model yeah, of what the yeah. human wants and yeah, then every so have, often... You have three parts. You have a model of what the human wants. You have the R algorithm that's maximizing that model. And you have the human that feeds, that, 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 trains, that trains the model. But also the R algorithm feeds back to the human so that it basically, whatever the R algorithm has learned to do goes back to the human. So, the, so you know, it basically says, okay, is this what you wanted? Or uh, of the things I'm now doing, which do you want more? Um, so so, so it's, this, it's this kind of gradual preference elicitation, um, which kind of helps to get around the, you know, well, if you get things wrong by a little, then you get the wrong behavior. It's kind of unfolding behavior in real time and incrementally showing you the consequences of, you know, of, of, of the behavior that you've seen. So this, you know, by, by no means does this, uh, you know, solve all, all safety problems. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, you know, one little bit of progress on, on one, one, one brick in the wall, yeah, yeah. one, one, one safety problem. But, um, you know, this is an example of the, the sort of, sort of thing I'm talking about. And so, yeah. you know, we, we use this both to solve ML tasks that you couldn't solve before because the reward functions were too hard to specify. Yeah. Um, and then kind of the impact on safety is, uh, is, is obvious because, you know, it, it, it allows us to specify goals more easily. Now there's all kinds of other problems you can have with it. It has to, it, you know, it has to, it has to scale. There are other safety problems. You don't want AI systems tricking you. There's, there's, there's so much, but, um, this, this kind of thing is, you know, the, there's an example of what, what we did. And, and I think, you know, we're going to try and do a lot more of it. Hmm. So, so how many times do you have to, to get feedback from the human to, to solve these problems? Is it, is it a reasonable number? Or yeah. So it, 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 it depends on the task, but, um, you know, on some of these, on some of these Atari games, which, you know, take about 10 million time steps to learn, mm. um, usually, you know, a, a human has to give feedback a few, a few thousand times. Okay. Um, so, you know, less than, less than 1% or a 10th ten, of a percent, the human actually has to pay attention to, um, we managed to train this kind of simulated like little noodle robot to do a backflip, um, yeah. with a, a few hundred, uh, a few hundred time steps. So we, you know, that's kind of the human clicking for about uh, thir 30 minutes or so. Um, okay. but we're, we're trying to get that number down, um, because. So this is the learning from human preferences, uh, paper. Uh, yes. Is that right? yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll put up a link to that and you yep. can take a look at this, uh, this little worm thing here that, that learns to, learns to jump progressively from just flailing around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was, the it, it got, it got a little bit of media coverage and my, my favorite headline was what this back flipping noodle can teach you about <laughs> AI safety. So it seems seems quite a or bit. Here's I think it was here. Here's what this back flipping noodle can teach you about so, about AI safety. That's, that, that's some good clickbait. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so so apart from those five issues that you talk about in the paper, what do you think are some other kind of important problems in the or open problems in the field? Yeah. Um, so one thing we didn't discuss in in the paper is uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, tra transparency of neural nets. So this mm. is kind of trying to figure out why a neural net does what it does, which, you know, you could eventually extend to why is a reinforcement learning system taking the actions it takes, right? It, it just kind of has a policy. It, you know, it's in a situation, it runs a bunch of things through its neural nets, and it says, you know, I'm going to move left, or I'm going to bend my joint, and doesn't really have much explanation for what it does. So if we could explain why, you know, break down the decisions made by made by neural, neural nets, then, uh, you know, that, that could could help with feedback, could help with uh, making sure that systems do what we want them to do and that they're not doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, which might mean they would do the wrong thing uh, in another circumstance. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's a pretty, pretty, pretty important problem. Uh, my, my co-author on the, on the paper, uh, uh, Chris Ola did a lot of work in that area with uh, a deep, deep dream, which is, you know, just kind of like all the, all the back propagated images generated by neural nets that was mm. originally designed to be a way to, uh, to, um, uh, visualize what maximally activates a given neuron within within a neural net. Ah, right. um, so it was it was initially a transparency technique, and uh, and uh, you know so so that's an area that uh, that that Chris is very excited about. So that that's another area I think we should work on. I mentioned before adversarial examples. I think that's uh, I think that's an area that's already getting a, a decent amount amount of attention, but pro probably should get more. Like everything in safety should get more. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's, that's an area we should work on. And also that has uh, like short-term safety implications. Like, uh, you know, so you, you, someone could like, you know, sabotage a self-driving car with uh, adversarial examples. And we, right. cer we certainly wouldn't want that. So to we happen. can't have that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So, so is that a problem for the rollout of, of uh, self-driving cars now that someone might put up a, 
a, a road I'm, sign that I'm, confuses them? I'm, I'm not I'm not the expert on it, and yeah. uh, I, I definitely don't want to give anyone any ideas about how to, right. do, how, how, how to do that. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've I mean, no I guess idea. It would, it would certainly end up being yeah. criminal, I would think, yeah, to do that I, I, well, in the same I, way as yeah, uh, hacking a computer no, system. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, yeah. Right. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd, be extremely, it'd be extremely legal. So I don't, I don't actually know the details of whether, whether that's, yeah. that's feasible or not and, and wouldn't discuss them if I did. Of course, yeah. Um, so as we, as we progressively work towards being able to control uh, you know, uh, yeah, AIs that we're developing, do, do you think it's going to be possible for people to, to understand the solutions that we've developed? So, so here you've, you've discussed this like three-step process by yeah. which you like train the, the, yeah. the machine or a reinforcement learning algorithm to understand the humans, and then that trains yep. the, the machine learning algorithm on the other side. Yeah. Um, so I can, I can kind of understand that. And there's other like big breakthroughs in history that like you can kind of get like you know, quantum yep. physics, like it's a particle and half a wave, and, yep. and yep. broadly you can grasp it. Do, do you think it's going to look like that, or will it just be like impossible technically? The, the, the AI that, itself or the safety? I guess the, 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 the way that we're going to get uh, machine learning or like other AI technologies to do what we want rather than, than, than flip out in some yeah, way we don't expect. I mean, I, I guess there's two possible questions. One is, are we going to understand at a very granular level every decision that's made? Um, and then there's, are we going to understand the principles by which the system operates? Yeah. Um, I think we'd better understand the principles by which the system operates. If we, if we don't understand those, I, I don't know how we can build them. And if we did build them, uh, I would definitely worry about their safety. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it's, it's realistic to understand the basic principles on which something is built. Um, but then there's a question of on what level of abstraction do we, do we understand it, right? The principles on which uh, you know, a visual neural net are built are, are, are very simple. It's you know, ba back propagation and alternating linear and nonlinear components. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much all, all there is to understand. Um, so then the question is, you know, how much do we know about what goes on inside the neural net? And that's kind of the question of transparency. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll gain a better understanding of transparency inside neural nets. And then the question is, how does that actually help us on safety? How do we actually use it? There's a lot going on inside neural nets, even if we could individually understand every piece of them. Uh, how does that actually, how does that actually help us? There's more units than I can you know, that I can read and, and, and understand. So I have to have some way of transducing that into something actionable, like correcting bad behaviors or something. So, so somehow that component of it has to fall into place as well. And uh, I don't know yet how that's going to happen. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's an urgently important research area. Yeah. All right. So, so let's turn now to how someone might be actual, uh, actually able to pursue a career in, in AI safety. Uh, what are the natural paths to, to getting a job at OpenAI or, or other similar organizations? Yeah. So, so I think my, my advice is going to be, you know, focused on, you know, uh, kind of the kind of AI safety work that I'm excited about. So for example, you know, Miri does some safety work that's kind of more based on, you know, mathematics and, and formal logic. Um, and uh, so, you know, you, if you wanted to do that, you'd need uh, kind of kind of different background. But uh, the safety work that, that I'm, I'm most excited about, I think, you know, just, you know, it sounds obvious, but the, the two things you most need are, you know, I an extremely strong background in machine learning hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a real deep, deep interest in, uh, in, 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 in AI safety. Um, you know, I think uh, to break those down, I think the first one is, you know, certainly at OpenAI, you know, we really try hard to, you know, to have a really high bar for, for hiring people. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know, just because someone wants to work on safety doesn't mean that we, you know, lower the machine machine learning bar, you know, at all. We have a lot of people here who are who are very good. So, you know, going to, uh, you know, get a PhD in, 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 in machine learning, going, going, going to get a PhD with, you know, you know, trying to work with the, be the best people you can work with, do the most groundbreaking work you can do. There's, there's kind of, you know, no, no, no ceiling to, you know, to, to how, how much of this, um, you know, helps. Um, you know, my, my sense has been that people who have a deeper understanding of machine learning, um, if they're interested in AI safety, also, also tend to really grasp, grasp the AI safety issues yeah. um, uh, 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 better, provided they think about them. And that's, that's the second component, which is, you know, I, I want people who really have a deep interest in uh, in safety, not just you know, oh, you know, oh, you know, it would it would be good if uh, if systems you know didn't didn't you know if it would be good if self driving cars didn't crash, but have have kind of a broad view of uh, you know where, where we're going with with AI, which could be totally different from my vision. Might might not involve it might not involve AGI, but uh, this general idea that we want to build machines that uh, that do what humans want and and carry out the human will. Um, I think that, um, 
you know, I think that idea is, uh, is, 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 is a broad one. And I, I want people working on safety to have a broad, broad view of that issue. So, you know, in the, in the EA community, I don't think the second, second one is, 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 is lacking. There are many people who are passionate about the second one. So I think, mm-hmm. I think the limiting factor is just very strong machine learning talent. Right. Yeah. So we just wrote a career review of doing a machine learning uh, PhD, which, yeah. which, which we'll put up a, put up a link to and, and you can have a read. But is, is, it, is it machine learning or bust? Are there, are there other options, that, like other PhDs that people could do that, that could be relevant? Like computer science so, or philosophy well, or well, I mean, yeah, uh, data you know, science. My my PhD wasn't wasn't in machine mm, learning, right? Um, so uh, so you know, and and we have a number of people here who you know who have backgrounds in uh, you know neuroscience or another area of com- computer science or mathematics or physics. Um, so it's entirely possible if you happen to be educated in another mm. another area to uh, to go into this field. But I think uh, going forward, if you're if you're a young student, um, I don't particularly see a case for. Uh, Doing a PhD in another field, if yeah. what you want to do is uh, is, 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 is machine learning, I mean, I, I guess I guess I'm saying it's it's pretty easy to convert skills in related areas, and uh, mm-hmm. you know sometimes it gives you perspectives that you don't have. But if you want to do machine learning, you should uh, you should get a PhD in machine learning. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I think another thing I'd add is uh, you know um, we do have some people working here who don't, who don't have PhDs. Um, mm. you know, my, my co-author Chris Ole actually never, never even went to, to college. Right. Um, wow. He, um, you know, he just, he, he, he just straight, she just straight went up to, uh, went, went to Google and, um, you know, uh, he, you know, he had to do, do a lot to prove himself, right. The, the level of, of technical ability you, you need to show is, is not lower. It's, it's even uh-huh. higher when you, when you don't have the educational background, but it's, it's totally possible. Mm. Um, uh, so, you know, yeah, I would, I would say the most important thing is just being able to do a lot of impressive and, and creative, uh, creative machine, machine learning work. Um, I would, I would even go so far as to say it's not, it's not my expertise, but, uh, even, even the people doing, uh, safety work that doesn't involve machine learning, I get, I get pretty nervous when they don't have a strong background in, uh. in machine learning, because even, even if they think that a machine learning system can't, can't be made safe, they should, they should know enough to understand why, why they think that's the case and what they think yeah. the alternatives are. Um, so, so that includes, I guess, people doing like mathematical research yeah. or philosophy research. I, if it if it relates to uh, if it relates to AI safety, um, I would say that even those people, I would encourage them to learn as much machine learning as possible, um, if only because they should understand approaches that they're that they're critiquing. Yeah, is it fair to say that you think that the approach you're taking, where you, you study uh, machine learning and try to actually improve AGIs, is is the best way to make AGI safe? That I mean, you'd, I, you'd rather see someone do that than go into these kind of other adjacent areas. You know, I, it's it's a little complicated because I think that as systems get more complicated, there may be ways in which we kind of combine neural nets with formal reasoning. So there's been been some work by um, uh, my my friend J- Jeffrey Irving and, and some of his colleagues on um, uh, doing uh, theorem proving. Um, so uh, basically, using neural nets to select the lemmas to be used for next theorem. So you know, if you take that far enough, you can imagine versions of um, you know, reasoning systems that basically, you know, they traverse some well-defined reasoning graph um, and, you know, they make kind of logical conclusions that are tractable, but it's all driven at the bottom by ne- neural nets driven kind of intuition where the neural nets decide what what conclusions you draw and, and where your thinking goes. And so I think this is how humans do symbolic tasks like, uh, you know, like physics or math or anything like that, right? We're, we're neural nets at the bottom and then we have a layer on top of that that is, is kind of, we use those neural nets to represent symbolic reasoning. And computer could probably do that even better because it can make sure that it never makes a mistake in this, in this symbolic reasoning, mm-hmm. um, that the symbolic reasoning engine is there. So, you know, you can imagine having formal guarantees on that kind of formal, formal, formal reasoning. But I think, I think when we get to that, it'll look different from the way things are currently de- being done. So uh, I'm, I'm really not against uh, for using formal, formal, formal reasoning methods and, 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 and using mathematics, but uh, I, I think it'll be possible to do that work more productively once we understand how it fits in with uh, with current systems. Um, I actually I actually don't know. Maybe the stuff that's being done now is uh, is, uh, is 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 productive, but uh, I'm I'm pretty suspicious of anything where you can't get that tight empirical feedback loop because I think it's really easy for people to fool themselves. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like the, the key piece of advice is to do a PhD in machine learning. So um, where might like what universities can people go to? Like what supervisors can yeah. they have? Do you have any suggestions yeah. there? So 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 I do want to repeat again that uh, uh, it's 
you know, there are ways not, not to do a PhD. Yeah. And uh, in, in particular, you know, a number of people go to a PhD for, for a year or two and then uh, do, an, do an internship here or a deep mind or somewhere and, uh, you know, then, then, then get hired. So even partial PhD can work. But, uh, you know, that said, I mean, you know, I think the usual suspects are places like uh, Stanford, Berkeley, yeah. um, you know, C- Cambridge or Oxford in, in the UK, um, you know, um, M- Montreal, y- Yashua, Yashua Benjo's group is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty well known for, uh, you know, for, for doing a lot, of, a lot, a lot of good stuff. And then, you know, there, there are kind of a number of other places, right. And definitely, you know, the, the P- PhD pools are, are where we hire, uh, you know, a, a lot, a, you know, a, a, a lot of our folks, cause you know, we know, we know a lot of the, we know a lot of the, the relevant professors, but, you know, but again, we have some people here who didn't 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 do the PhD work. I think yeah. I think the most important thing is being able to keep up with the literature and make creative original discoveries that you know that are are novel and that stay on pace with what what everyone else is doing. If you can do that, then that's the best thing. When when I talk to people who I want to switch into machine learning from from like another field, um, the advice I always give them is just get every possible model you can. If you're trying to learn supervised learning, get all the ImageNet models. Like implement them yourself. Read a paper, implement it. Read a paper, implement it. Same for supervised learning. Same for generative models. You just kind of get this knack for it after you've done it for a while, and it's it's really just kind of practical, hands-on experience, and you you just kind of get a you get a sense for these things once you've done them for a while. Yeah. Um, and you also find out quickly how, how good you are. Yeah. So I might be uh, showing my naivety to, to ask this, but so I, I th- machine learning is kind of only one way that you can approach AI, right? There's like other paradigms of how you yeah, produce artificial so th- intelligence. Yeah, right? yeah. This is this has historically been the case. It's It's gotten a little bit, I think, complicated. Um, you know, in, in the old days, we had kind of things like expert systems that were based on kind of purely unlogical reasoning. Um, and, you know, generally we found that those systems were very, very, very brittle because, you know, they couldn't represent the kind of high dimensional space that we see. So, for example, a vision system that's based purely on rules, it's, it's difficult because, you know, like if I'm trying to identify a face or an object, I mean, you know, I'm trying to identify these kind of blob, blobs in distribution space. Um, and so, you know, in some sense, these problems are inherently statistical. And so, you know, the, the rule-based systems actually don't, don't end up working all that well. Um, so, but, you know, historically, you know, there were statistical systems and there were rule-based systems. Um, you know, I think we can say now that the statistical systems have pretty, pretty decisively, uh, pretty decisively won. Um, I, you know, I sometimes hear people say things like, I don't think, uh, you know, AGI could be built using machine learning, or I don't think AGI could be built safely using machine learning or something. Um, I think when people say that they aren't really thinking kind of carefully about, about the alternatives. So, um, I'm, I'm quite sure that kind of like a pure rule-based system is, is not, is just not going to work because of the thing I said that, you know, you're, you have to ground what you're doing in sensory information and the, the sensory information is just inherently statistical and fuzzy. Um, so, uh, you know, pure rule-based systems I think are not going to work. What could happen is the thing I described before where you have a machine learning systems, you know, deep, deep neural nets being used to drive logical reasoning systems. Um, so that would be a hybrid of the two, but, you know, people are working that, that, that would be considered within the field of machine, machine learning. So, uh, yeah. you know, I think, um, we'll often in the future, machine learning may include logical reasoning processes, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be kind of, they'll be kind of at a higher layer. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what, what ends up, you know, happening, it, it will kind of involve reasoning in the same sense that a Go playing system involves Go, right? But uh, it won't really be like those rule-based systems that 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 we had before. Um, I mean, you can't be one hundred percent percent sure of this, but I think just the basic argument that like percepts are these statistical blobs, and so you have to use a statistical system at least at the beginning to to measure them, and then then whatever concepts you draw from them are kind of fu- end up being fuzzy statistical concepts, and that. If you want to bring if you want to bring those back to logical reasoning, the reasoning has to exist on kind of a a plane that's abstracted from that. Yeah. Um, 
So, so there's not some other AI paradigm that people should be doing, you know, deep study in? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, um, again, like, you know, in, in the history of AI, there were a lot of a lot of rule-based systems, but, you know, then then there were critiques written of them. So I think, I, I forget the guy's name, uh, Hubert, Hubert Dreyfus or something, who basically, he, he was like this continental philosopher who, who wrote this critique that people found really hard to understand, but what, what it was really saying was just, uh, you know, percepts are these statistical blobs and if you make a rule based system you're you're not going to you're always going to make mistakes and your system is always going to be brittle and wrong a lot yeah. um okay so assuming someone someone has has been studying uh, you know machine learning or one of these yeah. other related areas that that's a potential path in is, is there a natural path from from studying to actually getting a job at openai or another organization or do other intermediate steps that people have to take yeah i mean i think um you know, uh, again, P PhD students who, uh, you know, who do impressive first author work on papers are uh, people who, you know, were, were generally very excited to, uh, to, to interview. Um, so, you know, if, yeah, if you're, if you're in a good PhD program and you do some work, then uh, I definitely, you know, do some good work. I definitely encourage you to apply here. For people who are relatively early in their careers or come from another background, uh, there's a program at Google called the... Um, uh, what's it called? The um, the brain residency program mm. um, that allows you to kind of study machine learning with experts for a year, yeah. um, and then that kind of allows you to um, you know to um, uh, like uh, you know to to train your skills. And we've had a number of kind of residents who have applied here or elsewhere. Yeah, um, and so that ends up being a good thing. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, speaking speaking of which, th so there's a bunch of different organizations, right? So so there's OpenAI, there's, yeah. there's Google DeepMind, Google yep. Brain, uh, yep. Vicarious was another company, um, like m maybe more in the past. Then there's uh, the com human compatible AI yep. group at Berkeley. Do you yep. want to like go through a couple of these that you yeah, might recommend yeah. working on? So um, you know, as I said, OpenAI and DeepMind are probably the most focused on reinforcement learning, and yeah. uh, and that probably spend the most time thinking about about AGI. Not everyone here does, but you know, it's it's a focus here more than it is uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, Google Brain is where where I was before uh, before coming here. That's uh, was kind of the original research group at Google, and they're yeah. I would say a more kind of decentralized group that works on a wider wider set of topics. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know the Chris Ola there thinks about safety. Um, there is um, you mentioned yeah the Center for Human Compatible AI is uh, Stuart Stuart Russell's uh, uh, group. So you know we we collaborate with them some. We have some some interns from there uh, uh, come here. So. You know, I think uh, you know Stuart's been someone who's been thinking about safety for a while, so that's that's another good place to uh, work on it. Vicarious, to my knowledge, doesn't uh, think about safety. Oh, okay, um, right, right. Um, could be wrong, but uh, yeah. And are there are there other um, other groups that I, that we've missed here? Uh, um, or is it is pretty small. Like, are there any government research projects or not? Not anything, anything in China. Not, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. I okay, mean, yeah. you know, of course, there's uh, there's there's MIRI and FHI. Um, right. Yeah. So the Future of Humanity Institute yeah. and the uh, Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Yeah. Yep. Although, uh, so they but they're less doing machine re uh, learning. Yeah. Work. They're, they're, it's more their focus is less on less on machine learning. Although I think. Uh, Stuart Armstrong at FHI collaborated a bit with uh, with DeepMind on something that I think was uh, was like broadly machine learning related. Mm -hmm. uh, this was like studying interruptibility and corrigibility or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so we at eighty thousand hours we, we talk to people reasonably often who, who would be interested in, in doing like a job like like what you're doing. Is yeah. there is there any way that they can get indicators early on about whether whether that's possible or whether they're just kind of wasting their time and, and should look at other options because it's yeah. not going to be a good fit. You know, either they don't maybe have the you know machine learning chops or like culturally they're not going to be a good fit or something some other reason. So uh, I think I think the thing I mentioned about um, uh, implementing lots of models right. um, very 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 quickly. Um, if you want to know whether whether you're good. Um, a, a way that is a good proxy for how well you'll do in, in, in grad school as well as for the tests we give when, when people apply here is, uh, you know, find, find a machine learning model um, that's described in, in a recent paper, uh, implement it, and try and get it to work quickly. Um, if this is a painful process for you and you, you really don't like doing it, then you aren't going to like, uh, you know, you aren't going to like any the research that, that we do either on AI safety or, or other or other uh, or other or other AI stuff. Um, if you find you can do this quickly and or you really really like you really really like doing it, you find it addictive, uh, yeah. then uh, you know that's an indicator that this is something this might be something you, you really want to do. I wouldn't you know I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about the cultural stuff. Like if you're um, if you're 
skilled in this area and passionate about this area, then I, I don't think you'll have. I don't, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be a barrier. I, I don't think. I don't think you'll have. Uh, I don't think you'll have any problems. We try and be as open and, and welcoming as, as we can. I mean, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't have the. We don't have the luxury of selecting people on anything <laughs> other than their. Yeah. You don't like our favorite yeah. TV shows. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, why? Yeah, I mean, why? Why? It's you know that, that's just that's that's just that's just wasteful and pointless. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so how early can people do that test? Can they do that as an undergraduate? Uh, is, it, is it more like a PhD level thing? I, I mean, people can do it in high school. That's like, right. uh, you know, um, if you know, if you meet a, a seventeen year old, or like, how do you get into machine learning? I'm like, just go home and implement these models. You know, yeah. you don't, you actually don't need any kind of formal education. You probably need a thousand dollars to buy to buy a GPU. Yeah. Um, I have, I, ha- I have kind of con- considered at various times, like, you know, should we have like a like. A, a kind of like grant program where it's like, you know, if you're like 17 years old and you want to get into machine learning, I'll just like buy you a GPU. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah. If you're interested in, in AI safety, I mean, you know, that thousand, thousand dollars, you know, mo- most, 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 you know, uh, adults li- living in the developed world can, can afford a thousand dollars, but most 17 year olds might not be able to. So, uh, yeah. you know, if they don't already have access to one, uh, you know, m- yeah. might be a good way to get people started early. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, so if there's a 17-year-old listening here who wants to go and build their machine learning <laughs> yeah. model, what, what should they Google for? What should they start reading? Uh, I mean, um, you, know, you know, because I'm from the kind of, you know, open AI slash deep mind direction right. research, uh, you know, thinking about kind of re- reinforcement, reinforcement learning, yeah. um, you know, trying so, so, to... So what's the difference between reinforcement learning and machine learning? Do you want to... So, uh, so, uh, you know, machine learning is kind of the, the broader topic, and within it, there's several different areas. There's supervised learning, which is where you kind of try and predict some data that's been labeled. So an example of a supervised learning problem would be like, uh, you know, you're given images, and they cor- correspond to objects. So this is an image of a dog. This is an image of a cat. This is an image of a computer. And you train the network on lots of pairs of here's the image, here's what it is. And then it learns over time to map the two to each other. Um, Supervised learning has this kind of static quality where it's kind of like a one-off. You're trying to like you know predict one thing from another. Okay. Reinforcement learning is is more a setup where you're uh, interacting in a more intertwined way with uh, an environment. So uh, you know it, it's uh, the game of Go is like this: you make a move, and then you, the opponent or your environment makes a move, and then uh, you know and then then you make a move again. And overall, you're trying to win the game and you know, the, 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 the reward or figuring out whether, whether you've won the game or how well you're doing can be, you know, delayed by, by a long time. Um, and so the reason I focus a lot on reinforcement learning and, you know, why, why OpenAI focuses a lot on it is that, you know, reinforcement learning and things, things like it, extended versions of reinforcement learning, seem like a better fit for what intelligent agents do in general, right? Uh, you know, often, uh, often I have very long range goals, right? I'm, you know, trying to get an education, trying, trying to get a PhD, trying, trying, trying to have a career, you know, trying, trying to start a family or something. And these are all things that unfold over, uh, over years and involve interacting with my environment in this very, very complicated way. Um, yeah. So our reinforcement learning is kind of the only paradigm we have that even comes close to capturing this. Okay, so, so sorry, I cut you off. We were, we were figuring out what the 17-year-old yeah. should read to, yeah. to get their foot in the door. Um, so lots of papers in, uh, in reinforcement learning. I, I, I read about uh, what's called uh, DQN, just Google DQN. It's not a common acronym. Yeah. Um, uh, deep, deep Q Learning, That uh, this was a paper done by DeepMind in uh, 2013. Uh, p- p- yeah, um, p- policy gradients on uh, particular A3C and just kind of follow the trail of recent reinforcement learning things that have showed up on archive. Um, just go to our machine learning on Reddit and look at some some kind of re- you know recent papers in the deep deep neural net literature. Look at them, try and re-implement them, see if you can get results as good as the results that, that others get. It's really pretty self-contained and you don't need uh, that much help. If you're having trouble getting started implementing them, then um, you can start by, for many popular papers like DQN, you can find an existing implementation, then start with that and try to fiddle with it to see if you can make it better. Yeah. Um, and what, what kind of program are you running? Presumably you're not doing this in Excel. What's the... No, it's, so. um, you know, uh, t- uh, t- typically, you know, you'll use, uh, uh, the, the typical is, uh, you know, Python with uh, TensorFlow. So ten- TensorFlow is this this tool that the Google Brain team made for, um, you know, for, for doing 
general computations, but in particular deep deep neural net computations. Um, and so you'll find a, a large fraction of the stuff is implemented in uh, in, in TensorFlow or some some similar framework. So uh, you know P Python's pretty easy to learn. TensorFlow is pretty easy to learn. So uh, you know read some TensorFlow code of some stuff that's been implemented. Learn TensorFlow and implement some stuff yourself. Um, okay. Great. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 what's the what's the range of roles available? Is is yeah? How do they how do, how do they vary? Okay. So uh, you're talking about within machine learning or within safety related stuff? Uh, I guess mostly within safety. I think. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, you know, I can I can talk about what's being done here at at OpenAI. I would say there's two main uh, directions. There's the technical safety stuff, yeah. and there's um you know the uh, the kind of uh, you know po policy side of things. Um, mm -hmm. So on the te technical safety, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people working on it yet. But you know, the human preferences paper that that uh, I showed you is a good example of it. A lot of the papers we cite in Concrete Problems are uh, good examples of this work. Uh, DeepMind has had some recent uh, good good examples of uh, of of um, of safety work. I think the skill set, as I said, is very similar to the typical machine learning skill set, but you know, you should also be willing to work in a field that has relatively sparsely populated literature, which means coming up with your own ideas or uh, you know, or working very closely with someone who's, you know, one of the people generating the the, the ideas in the field. Yeah. Um so, you know, that has some downsides in that uh, you have to set more of your own direction, but it also has some upsides in that you can be one of the first people in a, in a totally new field. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, that, yeah, that's what excited me about writing writing concrete problems, right? I'm like, uh, you know, I could work on something that 200 other people have worked on or I could try and set a new direction. And maybe maybe it won't be exciting at all. And, uh, and you know, oh, well, at least I did something interesting. Um, or, or um, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's uh, you know maybe it turns out to be to be really exciting, and that's like a bet that I that I'm perfectly happy to take. Okay, so what would you recommend to someone who was considering entering the AI safety industry, doing machine learning work, uh, but they're worried that they're not going to have such great uh, long-term career options elsewhere, especially compared perhaps to, to doing machine learning work in a, in a more commercial way with less of a safety focus, or, or just going into whatever kind of pays the most or has the best career. So I think ML work is so hot right now that um, you know anyone who goes into it, particularly on the fundamental research side, it's easy to transition to applications. And I think the kind of safety work that we're doing has many of the same skills uh, as you know any other area in machine learning, even though the subject matter is very different. Um, and so I think you know some someone who does that is going to be in a very strong position um, to do very well in the future. Um, and you know I think it's it's probably you know, even if you're going into it for altruistic reasons, it probably just also happens to be one of the most secure, you know, career, financially secure career, career areas you could, you could go into. I mean, you know, we uh, recently had someone leave OpenAI who became uh, head of, head of AI at Tesla, like head of, head of all of AI reporting directly to, to Elon Musk. Wow. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I myself want to stay at OpenAI and, and, and work on, I work on safety. You know, I want to, Keep keep working on the research end all the way until until we get AGI whenever whenever that is. But if I didn't want to do that, if I if I if I if I wanted to leave, you know, there's like plenty of wonderful things that 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 I can do, and you know, the same will be true of other people who come here. Right. Is it more of a concern for people who would say be working at, at Miri doing doing non machine learning safety research? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know most of the people there are, are you know smart people who who uh, who uh, either had or could have you know really great careers as uh, as as software engineers. So they probably have you know great 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 options as well. I generally get the sense you know people who uh, who who go to Miri are really passionate about Miri's mission in particular and tend 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 to worry about this less. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's 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 de the the amount of kind of buzz and hype is definitely not as high as it is for you know the machine yeah, learning machine world. learning approach, right? Um, so yeah, pretty often we talk to people who are say in, in their mid twenties and, and they did a, a fairly quantitative uh, degree, maybe like economics or you know logic. Um, but but they don't but they don't know machine learning in particular. Is it possible for them to, to retrain to, to get into this, or, or is it all just just over for them at, at 25? Yeah. So I mean, you know, my my own example is you know until I was I don't know, 28 or 29 or something like I, I hadn't done any any machine learning. So it's it's definitely possible to do this. Yeah. Um, my my main advice is the same advice that I'd give to you know like the the 17 year old that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. which is just just uh, implement as many models as you can, as, as quickly as you can, um, just to see if 
you know, if you have the knack for it and you, you really enjoy doing it, because this is going to be, you know, greater than 50% of what, of what, of what your job consists of just, mm. you know, knowing how to have the real intuition to, to implement neural net models and have them work, how to put together new architectures that do new things, um, you know, first implementing these papers and then tweaking them. So that's a really cheap way to, uh, to, fi to find out whether, whether, you know, this is a career that you're good at and that you'll enjoy. Uh, I wouldn't recommend like going back and doing another PhD in machine learning. I think, you know, once you have a PhD, like there are some positions where Google wants you, for instance, wants you to have a PhD when they hire you, but, yeah. uh, you know, they don't really care what, what area it's in. They, they do want to know that you're like committed to some new area that you want to go into, but, uh, you know, it's more important to like, you know, for the pla for the places that care about, you know, whether you have a PhD, which we don't care that much, but even yeah. for the places that care, I think it's more important that you have a PhD than that you have it in some particular field. Right, right. So if you already have a PhD in philosophy, then you yeah. should just go and learn ML directly yeah. or do, do some kind of like internship somewhere? Yeah, I, I, I would say learn, learn ML, you know, implement a bunch of models, then go do an internship or the brain residency program at Google or, you know, come do an internship with us or at DeepMind. Uh, all, all these, all these are... Uh, all these are viable options and each step gives you a better idea of whether this, this, you know, whether this career path is really for you. Mm. And, and so, so really it's just the case that someone who did an undergraduate degree in economics can kind of jump in and, and try to run machine learning, like try, try to, you know, train machine learning on their yeah, own computer. I, I, and... Yeah. I mean, I think there's, if you know how to program Python and you can learn TensorFlow quickly, then, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very empirical field. So, mm. uh, you know, of course there's lots of kind of hidden knowledge that researchers know that they, mm. you know, that they kind of tell each other, but that kind of like, you know, it's, it's hard to express in, in the papers. Mm. Um, and so you won't pick up on, on everything, but you can certainly get started this way. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, talking to people about, about models, models you've implemented, talking to professional researchers, uh, you know, to, to get a sense of, uh, you know, what's an exciting thing to, to work on next. Uh, you know, that's kind of enough to, to get you started. Yeah. And so how, do, how does uh, working at OpenAI or, or Google compare to, you know, a machine learning role in academia? So I, I generally tend, I'm a bit biased, but I generally tend to give people the advice to come to, uh, to, come to industrial labs. Um, I think one reason is the industrial labs have gotten, uh, you know, and by, by industrial labs, I kind of mean open AI, even though it's not for profit, but just kind of the large non-academic research centers. Uh, they tend to have more resources, more compute. Um, and in part because of this, they've, you know, I think they've been winning the talent war recently. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think it still makes sense to, uh, you know, to, to, um, to go do, to, to go do, to go do a PhD. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, uh, um, staying in academia your whole life. I mean, I guess if you become a professor, then it becomes a lot easier to collaborate with, mm. uh, with, um, the industrial labs. So, you know, both we and DeepMind have, uh, you know, people who were our professors and spend part of their time there and part of their time here. Mm. Um, so it's all, it's, it's kind of all very feasible and there's a lot of mobility between the two, but in general, I've, I felt, you know, many people will disagree with me, but I felt that, you know, the most groundbreaking work has tended to happen at the industrial labs and, you know, over the last uh, couple of years, at least. Yeah. Interesting. Um, is there any effort to, to, to change that? Are universities trying to catch up or, or is it just too expensive? To yeah, I mean, they, get the they, they are, you know, there's uh, Yashua Benjo's group in, mm -hmm. uh, in, um, in, in Montreal is, you know, is, is quite large. He's one of the few, you know, major figures in deep learning who's kind of resisted the pressure to, mm -hmm. to go into the industrial world. And his lab does, you know, a lot of, a lot of great work. Uh, Peter Beal at Berkeley, Percy Leong at, uh, at, at Stanford and just kind of a number of others, including folks who, you know, don't, who do work that's not necessarily related to, to deep learning. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting work, uh, work everywhere. Um, mm. But uh, at least the kind of safety that, that I work on uh, tends to play best with kind of the cutting edge of ML work and explicitly tries to keep up with the cutting edge of, of ML work. Yeah. Yeah. That, that reminds me. Given the cost, how how is OpenAI funded? Is it just donations, or are you also like selling you it's, know products? No, at this no, point? we're we're nonprofit. Um, so uh, you know, I think think I mentioned earlier the the major donors are uh, Elon Musk, uh, Sam Altman, and uh, Dustin Moskovitz at this point. Yeah, so, so it's it's just donations, and it's at, the, at this point yeah. it's just donations. Okay. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Um, do you think is it is it possible for you to to sell things to to get extra computational power if you need, or like start start selling uh, services? Uh, or is well, that it's not, it's not a legal issue. It's outside yeah, your area. I, I'm not. I yeah. I'm not. I'm not an expert in this. I think. Yeah. You, uh, I'm not sure you can sell stuff if you're a nonprofit. Right. Right. Yeah. 
So is the is the work frustrating because you, you're not sure whether solutions actually exist and you can you know beat your head against a wall for, for quite a while before you, you figure out, well, maybe that there isn't even a way of solving it the way that you thought? Yeah, so I think actually that's the case in uh, any, any area of machine learning where you're trying to do original research. If you're trying to do something worthwhile, then uh, you don't already know if it can be done and you have to try stuff that seems crazy and... Yeah. Uh, you know, it might not. It might not work. So it's true of any area. I think it's especially true of an area that's very new, like mm-hmm. like uh, like like AI safety. And um, so, yeah, I definitely agree that uh, you know one of the trade offs for working in in AI safety is like you know, on one hand, you have this exciting ability to work on you know a new field that's just starting and it could be very impactful. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know. No one's kind of defined, you know, what what's what successful work looks like. Um, you know, we're still kind of laying out what the problem is, what the problems are, and what the work is that needs to be done. So, uh, you know, I think um, it, it definitely, you know, kind of requires an attitude of being willing to, you know, kind of, you know, define do do more to define problems yourself, and you need to be kind of kind of more creative instead of doing something that's, you know, that's an incremental improvement on the thing. Um, the thing that was done last, but you know, but that that's you know, I, I to me that's a good property. Yeah, yeah. So, so is it is it a good kind of role for someone who has a lot of grit and you know willingness to persist with things uh, despite adversity? Is that? Yeah, I mean, a, I think they're pioneering yeah, a new area. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I think that quality is is useful in any in any you know important or or original work, um, yeah. and and it is here as well. Yeah. All right. So, so turning now to non-machine learning approaches to tackling, you know, the, the, the problems in, in AI safety. Uh, what kind of non-technical approaches do you, do you see as promising? I, I interviewed uh, Miles Brundage at the Future of Humanity Institute uh, recently. Uh, do you have a view on any of the of the AI policy topics that we spoke about? Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't know precisely what what you guys spoke about, but um, um, you know. Uh, you know, I spend a little bit of my time speaking about the, the relevant policy issues. So I think, um, you know, um, you know, if if the humanity at some point builds builds AGI, then we're going to have to think about you know both how to handle safety issues at, as we're building it, yeah. um, and some of the co- coordination issues that are going to come up with respect to safety, and also the question of uh, you know who uses it, what it's used for, yeah. um, you know. Um, one one example of this is you you can imagine that um you know maybe if it's possible a really good way to build AGI would be to build an AGI instead of doing anything with it in the world um try and if it's possible first develop a capability to have it advise you on the situation you've put humanity in by building it right yeah. um and say look mm-hmm. like we've just opened this can of worms by by creating you uh, yeah. can you analyze our strategic situation and say what we should do because we're we're kind of aware that uh you know if we if we don't if we don't use you in the right way or we hand yeah. you to the wrong person, then it could, could be really bad for humanity. Yeah. Um, so if we were able to turn the problem in on itself that way, right, right. Um, that, that would be really good. And that's partially... Get, get, get the AI yeah. to make the world safe for AI. Yeah it's, yeah, it's partially a technical question and it's partially a policy question, which is how right. do we get ourselves in a situation where we can do that? I, I think that um, you know there's a lot of players. There's going to be more AI organizations. You know, government actors will someday have have something to say about uh, about about AI. Um, I mean, they already have something to say about AI. Someday they'll have something to say about about AGI. Yeah. Um, you know, when 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 we're more in a world where where AGI is is going to happen. Um, and so, <clears throat> what what strategies should we take towards towards you know towards all of these actors? How do how do how do we make sure that when everything's put together, it leads to a good outcome? And uh, you know, and and is there anything we can do today? Uh, to deal with these, you know, th- these kind of distant, distant problems, uh, and so those are those are kind of the set of policy issues that that we tend to think about. Um, you know, there's also some more thought on kind of short short term policy issues. Uh, you know, so uh, how you know how how can we uh, you know how how can we get you know people to think about more mundane issues of safety? You know, should the government regulate things? Should um, you know, uh, you know, what should policies be on self, self-driving cars and stuff? What should policies be on, you know, automation and, and job creation? Um, we do some of that stuff, but a lot, lot of people think about that. So, uh, so we tend to focus more on the, 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 the long range stuff, uh, not, you know, it's like less actionable, but there aren't that many people thinking about it. So, uh, you know, we might as well do whatever thinking we can, we can on it, which, which might yeah. be, there's nothing that can, can actionably be done, but we want to at least, uh, consider. 
Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on, on how we can ensure that you know all of the players kind of cooperate and, and avoid having an arms race where they just try to improve their machine learning techniques uh, really quickly without regard to safety? It seems yeah. like you're, you're collaborating a great deal with, with DeepMind yeah, and yeah, things this, are all very yeah, this, collaborative. Yeah, this was in, in, in part uh, you know, m motivated by the idea of uh, the organizations working together. So, you know, it helps that, you know, uh, you know, my, my myself and you know some of the some of the founders of, of of DeepMind have known each other for a while. We all you know we all kind of you know think about AGI and and you know and and think that that safety issues are important. So mm. you know uh, you know when 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 you know people at the major organizations are friends with each other and work to actively collaborate, then that reduces the probability of, of any kind of conflict. Mm. Um, because you know people people know each other there isn't you know fear 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 or uncertainty and you know if there's there's a disagreement we can we can work it out um, so then the question is how does that scale to there being being a lot of uh, how does that scale to there being a lot of organizations yeah. um, and you know how, how does that scale to others who get involved once they see how, how powerful AI is can we make mm -hmm. them cooperate as well um, and my, my hope is that we can um, but uh, no it's it's not you know it's not it's not an easy thing yeah um so do you think it would be a good or bad thing if, if AI were, were developed sooner? So there's been the, kind of this explosion of investment in, yeah. in machine learning and improvement. Is this something yeah. that we should be pleased about or concerned about or just I kind mean, of neutral, not sure whether it's good? Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of hard to say. I mean, the, the obvious bad thing is if you're, like, if you're like really afraid that there will be safety problems with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with AGI, then, uh, then you might think it was a bad thing. And a lot of people think it's a bad thing for that reason. I mean, my, my, my view is, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of relatively early in the game, and I think there's a substantial probability that, uh, you know, the gloomy analyses are really misunderstanding the safety problem and, and how, the, how, the safety problem, uh, how the safety problem works. Um, you know, some counter risks to worry about are that something bad happens to the world in the meantime mm. um, while, while, while we're trying to develop AGI, mm. or that, um, you know, or that, uh, that AGI is, is used in, in a bad way. Um, mm. And... Uh, you know, uh, I guess I guess a couple of years ago, I, I often made the argument that we were in a relatively peaceful geopolitical time, so yeah. it would be good that uh, if AGI would be built. But uh, I'm I'm starting to wonder in the, the last clear. year or so that maybe we're not in such a peaceful ge yeah. geopolitical state. Um, yeah, as, as we're recording this, everyone is flipping out about North Korea developing uh, intercontinental ballistic it, it, yes, missiles. So. Yes, no, I mean so. these these things are pretty deeply concerning. Um, yeah. You know, we. Uh, we, there's been a lot of political instability in the rest Western world in, yeah. in, in the last uh, year. And, uh, you know, aside from the usual reasons why this might make me unhappy, it's it's made me unhappy because it, it, it creates a less stable political environment yeah. in which uh, in which AGI would happen. So so I don't know. I mean, I, I will say, I, you know, I think I think I think we're better off if AGI is developed in a stable political environment with leaders who are intelligent and have reasonable views. Mm. Um, and so I'd like that to happen. And I, I no longer know whether that means that AGI, whether that <laughs> means AGI right should now, happen or, soon or, yeah. or that it should happen in, in a long time. I guess it depends whether the current trends, uh, the current trends that we're seeing in the last year continue or if they're only a blip. If they're only a blip, then, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. In a few years, we're back to where we are before. But if, mm. if we're on a general trend in like, trend. In, in a bad, in a bad direction, then, uh, you know, then uh, then maybe it maybe it's bad to wait too long. Yeah, um, I guess it's a difficult thing to tell. Yeah, so so I think it's I think it's I think it's pretty complicated. Um, and I think uh, you know I think pure pure safety considerations tell us that it's always it's always good to have more time. Although you know at the same time, some of the hardest safety problems to solve may be problems we can't solve until you know the last couple of years until we build AGI. So so in that case, uh, you know delay delay doesn't really help doesn't, us. It just kind of delays the crunch period right, that we'll have to right. face. Uh, so, um, I guess it's like someone. Uh, trying to finish an essay by a particular deadline. If, yeah. if they know they're only going to do it the night before, yeah, then, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Doesn't much matter when the deadline is. It doesn't doesn't much matter when the deadline is. Um, so uh, I, I think I think it's a complicated question. I mean, my it's it's not a variable that I have a lot of control over. It's yeah. you know it's happening at the field level. So I I prefer to try to control variables that I have some Focus control on what over. What you can and change. Yeah. One thing I have control over is that it seems like there's at least some safety work that can be done now. Yeah. Um, and so I'd like to do it. And it seems like uh, there are some ways that different AI organizations are not collaborating now um, yeah. that, they, that, you know, that we can encourage them to collaborate. And so I've also been, been working on that. Okay. Um, and and I, think those, uh, I think those efforts have been successful. And so I feel like you know, it's been good to cause things to happen that wouldn't have caused otherwise. But then there are all these other things that I feel like I have no control over whatsoever. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I've taken up an awful lot of your time here, and I'm sure you have uh, have to get back to your to your research. Uh, yeah, hit, hit these deadlines. So, is there anything you'd like to, to, to say to people who are considering, you know, following your, your example and doing this kind of research before we finish? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, um, we're we're of course, you know, hiring for uh, you know for for very talented machine learning people who care care a lot about about AI safety. Um, so, uh, you know. Uh, you know, welcome, welcome applications at, at OpenAI. Um, we collaborated a lot with the DeepMind safety people. So, you know, I, I'm always, you know, as, as, as part of this collaborative spirit, you know, I, 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 you know, I think that's a really great team as well. And, and people should, 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 should apply there, there as well. It's kind of convenient to have a place that's in Europe and a place that's in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of good work going on at, at you know, several different places. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add 80,000 Hours has been doing a whole lot of research into this question of, uh, you know, how can we positively shape the development of artificial intelligence? Um, and, and we're uh, coaching some some people to try to help them get get jobs at places like uh, like OpenAI. So uh, if, if you feel like you're in a really good position to do that, then uh, then fill out the the application on, on our website. Uh, we think it's it's one of the most uh, high impact roles that that someone could take if, if they're able to do it, uh, which is one of the reasons why we've you know we've looked into it uh, so so much. Hopefully over the next few years uh, we'll, we'll see quite a lot more people go into this field and and it won't be so neglected and and uh, we can we can be a bit more relaxed about it. But it's been fan fantastic to, to have you on, on the show, uh, Dario. Yes, thanks, um, thanks for I having me. Ho hopefully we can, we can check back in in a couple of years and find out what, what OpenAI has been up to. And, and hopefully you've found lots of, lots of new talented people to, to work in the area. Hopefully. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much.